speak. For those of you that have heard me speak about the advocacy issue, there may be a bit of redundancy, but I want to really focus today on the wicked problem aspect. Science and natural resources is uh, particularly wildlife issues that I deal with, energy issues, water issues classically in the West, uh, development issues, planning. These are always controversial, and the role of the media in the recent years has, has really magnified that. We have lots of people that are self-proclaimed experts, and in some ways the voice of scientists and policymakers and resource managers has been somewhat diluted. Everybody that sits in the barber chair is an expert on wildlife ecology now. For those of us that are in positions to have a, a, a well-grounded input, it's not really a productive option for us to um, stick our head in the sand, really, to declare confidentiality or to declare academic freedom or, from a government perspective, to obfuscate and and just put a wall of bureaucracy in, in front of somebody. I mean, it'll get you off the hot seat. It'll allow you to um, defer the problem, but you're not addressing the problem. So what ultimately I would like to do is I'd like to call for us as scientists and managers and experts to speak to the issues and the problems that are facing us. And how we approach this in large part determines whether we make some progress or whether we just inflame and increase the will of those that would oppose us. It's really quite easy to make a bad problem worse. So why am I interested in this topic? Well, for one thing, it's a, it's a sheer matter of bravery and, and my mentors and the models that I've looked up to. I've seen people stand up in the face of really hard opposition, really difficult situations, and I've greatly admired those folks. Um, these, these brave souls can actually enrich the debate um, over difficult resource management problems and bring the, the public into the decision-making process. So this is a room full of experts and I would contend as one of my premises that you speaking up is your obligation. It's basically distributive democracy to take your expertise, involve others, and recognize the intricate disagreements that occur, the stakeholder positions and interests, and engage those folks and try to find a solution. Okay, the other reason I'm interested in this topic is because I've gotten burned a few times really badly. Uh, if I have time to, well, I'll digress for a second. As a government scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey, it was my job to build large levy impoundments to show that uh, we could reclaim coastal wetlands. The oil companies funded it, they were all behind it, they had the answer that they wanted in their pocket before the research was funded, and indeed we grew beautiful plants. The problem was the area subsided and sank and we had a net loss of wetlands. And that was not an acceptable outcome. It turns out the levees blocked the sediment that was moving into the area, and the sediment was what built land, not plants. And when we went to publish this, we found barriers, we found governmental interference, we found triple reviews, we found because the oil companies had an opportunity to put, well, we were talking hundreds of millions of dollars for the canals that needed to be dredged. And so as a little budding idealistic scientist, I got crushed like a bug. I thought there has to be a better way to do this, to involve these folks from the very start. So I like this kind of seminar. It's the best sort of seminar for me because it gives me the opportunity to step outside of my normal ecologic, ecologist role and do some reading and learn some new things. The other nice thing about this is the lights stay up. There's no PowerPoint that to futz around with, worry about. And I have three major topics, three major points I'd like to make. I'll go ahead and tell you what they are up front. First, we have to understand what kind of problems we're dealing with. And here I'll define wicked and complex problems. <clears throat> Second, I want you to remember that there is a field of science that very few of us have been trained in. A few of you probably have, actually, in the policy sciences that explicitly deals with the most intractable problems that we, we face in natural resources. This, this field of policy sciences I'll talk a little bit more about. And I mean, I wanted to give you some path forward. It's, it's one thing to define a wicked problem and say, there it is, go deal with it. Transdisciplinary resource 
um, manage our, our research is one of the ways we deal with wicked problems. The third point, if I have time, and I'll go as long or short as time allows, is to talk about how scientists step into wicked problems and how they address them and some of the costs and potential for that. So, I mean, ultimately, I do want to encourage you and empower you to, to tackle these wicked problems. So, knowledge is a really powerful tool. Knowledge is per persuasive. But that knowledge has to be defensible and believable by those people that you're trying to persuade. In the 1770s, a fellow named Francis, uh, Franz Anton Mesmer, whose name you might know gives us the word mesmerize, he contended that we all have animal fluids inside of us that respond to magnets. And by the manipulation of magnets, he could manipulate your behavior. Well, he's now seen it widely as a charlatan, that this was a compelling idea that just didn't work. But you know, recent research suggests that there might be some magnetism effects on people. I mean, they certainly will sell you expensive shoe soles, inserts, or fancy pillows, or mattresses that have magnets in them. And indeed, some of the migratory bird research says, yes, if you put magnets on a pigeon's head, the pigeon will be disoriented or won't migrate in, in the same orientation. I always like to say, if you put a one kilogram magnet on a pigeon's head, he will find the earth very quickly. <laughs> But my point is, we have to be a little bit careful about how we use knowledge. We have to be aware of the language of persuasion. We enter into topics that the public must ultimately decide upon, and we don't want to push too hard. We also have to be careful to inspect our own intentions. Are the things we're, we're pushing forward, are they self-serving? Is it ego-driven? Does it feather the nest of our own corporate culture or our bureaucracy? Is it our way of advancing? Or is it the pursuit of truth as we best understand it? Is it designed for rational use and implementation? Does it address problems in a fair way? And when I say fair, you have to ask the question, fair to whom? So, about the problems. What are the real intractable problems we face in the management of Alberta's resources? You know them. They're neither purely scientific are purely sociological, are purely financial, are purely logistical, are purely political, or purely anything. They have elements of all of these. Jack Ward Thomas, the former chief of the U.S. Forest Service, was brought to campus a few years back and spoke at one of our forest industry lecture series. And the thing that I brought away from his lecture, well, two things, but the most important was a quote he gave. He said, to solve natural resource problems, we only need to know two things. The first thing we need to know is what is to be done. The second thing we need to know is who gets to decide. Now, that's a little reductionist and it's more complicated, but Jack's main point was that the technological and scientific prescriptions that we all are comfortable with not all, I know there's some planners in the group, but the, the natural resource scientists are comfortable with. Might be much more straightforward part of the, pollution, of the solution than gaining permission to say who gets to decide. But you know, actually the technological part isn't always simple either. And this is a quote that I've, I've used several times by Lawrence J. Peter from the University of Southern California. You may know Lawrence J. Peter's name, which is more immortalized in the, the Peter Principle, that we will all rise to our level of incompetence. And I'll repeat this twice because it's backwards logic, but he said, some problems are so complex that you have to be highly intelligent and well informed just to be undecided about them. So some problems are so complex that you have to be highly intelligent and well-informed just to be undecided about them. So I sat back and thought, well, that, that's me in a, a nutshell when it comes to climate change. I, I trust the process that's produced the knowledge that convinced me that climate change is there, that climate change is real. And I, I'll, as a scientist, will speak that, but it's not my original research. I don't understand global circulation models. I don't understand gas fluxes. That's not my field but I trust the institution that tells me this is happening. Okay, let me talk a little bit more about the nature of problems and wicked problems in particular. 
1973, an urban planner named Horst Riddle wrote a seminal work describing problems such as those faced by Alberta scientists and managers. He called them wicked problems. This has later been picked up in ecological literature by Buzz Hollings and makes a very cogent argument that much of what we face is not a simple scientific problem. Some of the wicked problems you might recognize. Maintaining boreal caribou on, on fragmented industrial landscape. Reconciling trail use impacts between hikers, bikers, and horsemen. Finding an acceptable level of oil sands production in relation to the ecological damages incurred. Allocating scarce water rights in a dry country. These aren't simple scientific questions. There is no silver bullet answer. So what are the attributes of a wicked problem? I'll give you six. There's about 12 listed in the common literature, and I'm sure you'll hear some more of these repeated and enforced later on because it's a great line of the speakers with good examples of wicked problems. First, you don't understand the problem until you have a solution. It's an ill-structured uh, question with many interlocking sets of issues, so you don't understand the problem. Second, there is no stopping rule. Because there's no single problem, there's no clear solution. So you have to work on the problem basically until you run out of resources. It goes on and on. This is the difference between a knife wound and a cancer. One, you repair if you can. The other, you deal with and live with as long as you can. Third, solutions to wicked problems are neither right nor wrong. They're simply better or worse. Soil quality is an example. Is it high, medium, or low? Where are the thresholds? Where are the break points? Fourth, Every wicked problem is unique and novel, like wildlife species. No two species are the same, identically the same. Five, every solution to a wicked problem is a one-shot operation. There are also unintended consequences. But we try something, of some solution, and the problem shifts and changes. And the next time we try, it's with a different solution. And six, Wicked problems give no alter have no given alternative. If we can't settle on one primary endpoint, how can we settle on multiple alternative endpoints? So this is what we're faced with in lots of our, our environmental issues in Alberta. Let me list a few more classic Alberta examples of wicked problems. Right now, there's a, a conference going on in northern Alberta in Grand Prairie uh, looking at grayling, the management of grayling, small fish that's probably going to be a, an endangered or threatened species shortly. Setting the catch and release or the harvest limits on grayling is a wicked problem. We have multiple stakeholders, they all have a different view of how to, how to handle that. Storing CO2 in underground chambers to curb Alberta's total uh, carbon emissions is a wicked problem. Everybody's got a different take on that one. Releasing biological control agents to control noxious weeds Classic wicked problem. We don't know what's going to happen next. Prescribed burning in the mountain parks. Grizzly bears, should we have a hunting season or should they be an endangered species? Uh, encouraging or allowing elk shooting farms in Alberta. Highly controversial, multiple stakeholder perspectives and tremendous social input. Increasing woodland grazing by cattle and FMAs. Peat harvesting from Alberta bogs, even if it's going to be used for organic farming. We currently don't know how to reclaim a mined out peat bog. So at this stage of complex and interacting problems, experts in, expert knowledge becomes incredibly valuable. But it's also valuable to be able to synthesize and make inferences across this gulf of unanswerable questions. And you know, it can be done in lots of ways. It can be done through trickery. It can be done through politics, deception, option, uh, uh, opinions, public ad campaigns, you can appeal to a few very powerful top-down folks and get quick results, but they're not long-term, durable, defensible results. So how does one approach a wicked problem if we have any real hope of finding a solution? Well, my second point, I'd like to suggest that this transdisciplinary research, TDR, is one way of reaching solutions to wicked problems. Yale professor Susan Clark 
uh, has worked for many years. Uh, she's the Coleman uh, Endowed Chair at, at Yale. She's got 16 books, 250 refereed publications, uh, traveled the world, and has worked on many sticky, sticky, wicked problems dealing with wildlife. Things like a management plan for the Jackson Hole elk herd, or black-footed ferret reintroductions, or grizzly bear and wolf uh, management plan for Yellowstone National Park, uh, koala bears in Australia. She wrote an informative little book called The Policy Process, A Practical Guide for Natural Resource Professionals. Very accessible, short, and really a nice read. In it, she describes what she calls a three-strand rope model, which I found very, very helpful in getting my head around the bare bones of a wicked problem. The first strand is the one we're all comfortable with, or I'm comfortable with, I should say. It's the biological and scientific knowledge. It adds much to the discussion, but uh, just because we're comfortable with this, we mistakenly resort to trying to make decisions based on the best science or on the data. We're going to let the data speak. Unfortunately, that's not the way most of the world sees things or votes. It's just one strand of the rope, and we need to recognize the limits of how far our understanding and our data will take us. The second strand, which is even more encompassing than, than the biological or the scientific, is the sociological strand. It's what people care about, what the public can understand, and where support comes from. It comes from what they value, and it doesn't necessarily have to be rational in a deterministic, positivistic, scientific approach. It can be highly emotive and highly irrational. But it adds strength and nuance to our policy process. So that's two strands. The third strand is the governance strand or the decision-making process. Governance, power, regulation, these determine how information gets used. This is a large part of what Jack Thomas was talking about when he said, who gets to decide? The power to make policy or set regulations and enforce rules and ensure compliance is 100% absolute in a dictatorship. It all comes from one individual. But we don't operate in Alberta under a dictatorship. No comments here. We do have a powerful government, but there's room for lots of other approaches. There is an entire field, albeit small, but an entire field devoted to the scientific study of how decisions get made. Um, the elements of success and failure in addressing wicked problems in the policy process, and it's, called, it's called the policy sciences. Now before you dismiss this as a soft science, it's helpful to remember that it employs scientific the scientific method, it's based on theory, much of it built on the early work of, a, of an individual named Harold Laswell. It uses testable hypotheses about outcomes. Data is collected on attitudes and behaviors. It uses sophisticated analyses such as Q-sort and structural equation modeling, which us natural scientists are just getting around to using. The, the social sciences folks are way ahead of us in the, in the uh, complex analyses. It has bias control, it has its own peer-reviewed journals, and it yields dependable repeatable results. There are very few people in the world that are qualified to integrate all three strands. So what to do? Well, you have to open the palm a bit. As the Taoist says, the open palm is the firmest grip. You have to bring others with that expertise into your team. I mean, very few biologists are steeped in these qualitative social analyses. And so they're, they're lacking somewhat. They don't understand discourse analysis or Canadian census data or recursive or snowball techniques. Or they don't know the structuralist, the Marxist, the postmodern uh, perspectives. The real approach to a wicked problem. It involves this transdisciplinary problem solving or working with teams of experts. Now what this does, it's guaranteed to slow your progress towards a solution down somewhat. But if you think of a triangle of three possible requirements, it can be, your solution can be fast, it can be cheap, or it can be accurate. Now pick any two of those. Fast, cheap, accurate. You can't optimize for all three at the same time. Now as another quick example about this social natural science divide. In the natural sciences, 
facts are our friends. They make up a large part of how we advance knowledge. The bricks of knowledge, the mortar of understanding, we build these structures. Um, in the social sciences, facts are somewhat more fluid. And the definition that I get is a fact is something that a large group of people agrees on at one point in time. They're not immutable. The earth at one time was flat. The earth at one time was round. The earth now is ovoid with some bumps. The climate to some is cooling, the climate to some is warming, and to some other folks it's doing both at the same time in different places. Barren ground caribou are going extinct, or they're moving through a natural 70 year cycle, or they're abundant and not in short supply around our village. Exotic plants are beautiful invaders, so to some they're invaders, to some they risk commercial, the commercial crops, and to some commercial crops are inv invasive exotics. It goes on and on, it's very perspective delimited. And so we have to be very careful about the use of facts. There are some things we can agree to ex accept and build on. But we, don't, we do that at our peril if we do it without consultation. Facts are necessary, but unfortunately, they're not sufficient. That old Boolean uh, characteristic of necessary but not sufficient. To convince the public or to establish policy. We have to consider human perceptions, emotions, and the things that drive their say and their vote. Okay, my third point uh, related to wicked problems is that given incomplete information, people are not willing to listen to a list of someone else's facts. Can or should scientists speak out? Should we advocate for our best understanding? Well, yes and no, or it depends. My older brother loves to say, you know, indecision may or may not be a problem. In preparation for this topic, I went out and took an informal poll of, of 10 senior academics in my department. And I did not ask Dr. Nate, so she's, she's clear on this one. Um, and I asked them the question, is advocacy compatible with science? And here, is the, here are the two extreme responses. The first was, science and advocacy are mutually exclusive. Advocacy is a slippery slope toward untruth. Hmm. No. No mincing words there. On the other end, this quote, scientists have a moral and ethical obligation to advocate. It's a critical component of their job to clearly deliver the results and interpretation of their research in context to the very public that pays their salary. Sounds reasonable too. So which is it? I, one of my interviewees said, the, the one that said that it's a slippery slope, I said, well, come on, advocacy is not a four-letter word. He said, no, it's an eight-letter word. It's twice as bad. <laughs> said, it, there was no, no convincing this individual that we had to be stick to, to what the data said and not question it. So if I'm going to use the word advocacy to push the best available knowledge forward, I need to define it. And I would say to advocate is to be a proponent for one set of propositions amongst a collection of possibilities. You have to make a choice of what the best way forward is. It's to lend one's active support to ideas, policies, or proposals. So you've got to go out on that limb and say, this is what, now you might be wrong, and it, it makes sense to be willing to change, but at this time, this is what I believe is the best way forward. Now, advocacy is a moderate position. It lies somewhere to the right of simple reporting, just the facts, ma'am, and somewhere to the left of propaganda. Let me define propaganda, just to try to clarify this, because some people consider advocacy and propaganda to be synonyms, and I don't. Propaganda is designed to influence people's opinions and propagate a philosophy or point of view beyond the issue at hand. It's the dissemination of biased ideas and opinions, often through the use of lies or deception. Propaganda often represents facts selectively, uh, and thus possibly lying by omission, omission, not lying by emission, lying by omission to encourage a particular synthesis. It uses loaded phrases to produce an emotional rather than a rational response to the information presented. I think of, of propaganda as, as a synthesis of propagate plus agenda. 
there's definitely an agenda behind the propagation of this litany. But unlike so much propaganda, responsible advocacy is expected to be non-deceptive, transparent, in good faith. But advocates make the scientific community a little uneasy. In a perfect world, we would have an infinite set of replicable experiments, but it's not a perfect world. If the experiment is soil carbon in the year 2050, or the atmospheric composition of CO2 in 20, uh, 2100, well, there really can't be objective data on 21, in 2100 for another 90-something years. There's some level of subjectivity or uncertainty in all of these, but in, in opposing perspectives call for a decision to be put forward. We have to select one proposition over another. Well, I'm still in favor of doing it. I'm in favor of going out on that limb and taking a few saws with the saw. That um, responsible advocacy requires that we be explicit about the non-fact influences. Remember that second and third um, strand on the three-strand rope model. We need to spell those out and say, this is the context that we're talking about. So I've developed a few maxims, not the magazine now, but some statements that I think are, are true. And I'd like to run through those. How am I doing on time? I can't see that clock. Uh, you're good. Good. Thanks. <clears throat> First maxim. State the degree of uncertainty and unsupported assumptions that you're relying upon. One of the ways we can lie to our audiences is by selecting the selective presentation of information. The second maxim. Recognize and acknowledge counterpoints and positions not taken. Those that would oppose you most eloquently, you owe it to you, the, the listeners to recognize their points. You may not agree with them, but you don't just wall them off and try to shout them down. There's some great debates in the field of science, long-standing debates um, about cloning and stem cell replication and climate change and and fluoridation of public water and salmon farming, the list goes on and on where you have well-recognized proponents and opponents. And the battle is quite entertaining, but they, they step, stoop sometimes to character assassination. And that's not really very productive. That entrenches the battle and doesn't work us anywhere closer to a solution. I'm going to skip a, a few other things and go to my next maxim. <laughs> Okay, maximum three, there's safety in numbers. Use your colleagues as reality checks. This is the, the rain that pulls you back on advocacy. This is where peer review, this is where transdisciplinary teams, this is where that reality check of the, of the colleague down the hall might say, uh-uh, uh-uh, you're stepping over a line here. You can't really say that. You know, while we admire conservation's great men and women of history, People like George Bird Grinnell, uh, wildlife biologist Aldo Leopold, marine scientist Rachel Carson, climate change researcher Stephen Schneider. These are folks that have gone out on a limb, have done it right, and have affected the entire paradigms of their field and the way we see things. Closer to our era, David Suzuki, uh, mathematical ecologist uh, E.C. Palou, limnologist Dave Schindler. They're in our backyard in some cases. These are preeminent scientists that have spoken out, or advocated, if you will, for policy change. And, we've, and we have this need for continued gladiators, is what Jack Thomas calls them, gladiators to go forward and carry the, the message forward. And you know, sometimes it blows up in your face. It takes, it, it takes a certain um, level of stature and in, in savoir faire and confidence to do this. Uh, Three books with controversial messages some of you have probably read. The book Collapse by Jared Diamond. It's a synthesis of anthropological research and commentary on civilization. Sociobiology by E.O. Wilson. It was fiercely attacked for over a decade by the, all the social sciences, um, but it's continued to carry weight. And that classic of all classics, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Now, Rachel Carson in particular was called an hysterical extremist by the chemical industry and certain members of the media. They attempted to go into a character assassination and discredit Ms. Carson um, by challenging her credibility as a scientist. And you know what? It completely backfired. Here was this well-meaning woman who was an established author 
She had uh, 55 pages of references, including a list of scientific reviewers that had critiqued her book. She had done her homework, she had, had spelled it out, she had stated her level of uncertainty, and it stood the test of time. And even the, the best uh, staged opponents couldn't bring her down. So that leads me to maxim four. That is, credibility is a prerequisite for effective advocacy. We shouldn't speak at too far afield from our expertise because you'll get out on that limb and you'll saw all the way through and you'll fall. So scientific results are our gold standard in my field. Um, and this, the science media, the courts of law recognize this. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't frame the messages in ways that are understandable and palatable for the public as well. We don't deal with hard science, sciences. We aren't microbiologists, we're not physicists, we're not mathemat mathematical um, scientists. We have a degree of biological uncertainty that pervades everything we do. And so we walk on tippy toes waiting for the axe to fall. My next maxim is that good might be context dependent. When you're dealing with wicked problems, um, there are surprise unintended consequences that come from left field sometimes. We've learned a lot about strengthening our scientific procedures, but it's been particularly inadequate in addressing the incredibly complex and wicked questions that interlinked social, economic, political, and biological dimensions. Again, its facts are necessary but not sufficient. We need that three-strand rope. One of my very favorite authors, Aldo Leopold, wrote in a Sand County Almanac that it's a compelling and beautiful quote that you've probably heard, maybe have memorized. He said, and I quote, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends to do otherwise. How can you really argue with that? But let me tear it apart. Sorry, Aldo. This is just an exercise of demonstration. It presumes that we know what is right. It presumes that the current conditions are optimum. It, it presumes that we know what integrity means. And it presumes that stability is good. And it also presumes that everyone finds beauty in the same things. A thing is right when it tends to preserve integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It's wrong when it tends otherwise. This is accepted only because the public sentiments have allowed it to be accepted. But under critical discourse review, it, it doesn't really hold up. It's well-intentioned. And I, I'd back it, but I'm not sure the public will. If it's going to cost them jobs, or moving their, their village, or changing their water use. There are other examples that Michael Soule, the father of conservation biology, has given as conservation biology as a normative science, his attempt at hybridizing this to recognize that people's values matter in decision making. Maxim six, advocacy carries a cost for scientists. There are risks inherent in that. Sometimes we speak across this huge gulf of worldview, and much of it is age related. Uh, it helps me to remember that I'm entering the curmudgeonly middle age and dealing with students. Uh, students where the blue spherical images of Earth from outer space existed before our graduating seniors were born. They'd grown up in this maelstrom of advocacy and barraged with slick messages from Madison Avenue, things like save the seals, organic is best, no-till, bird friendly required, the three arts recycling, say no to fur, save Amazon, Amazon save the oceans, maybe save my breath as a 55-year-old. <coughs> a lot of citizens are motivated by this realization that we do have limitations now, and they feel morally compelled to act. That's a really nice social modus, but they're skipping the other two, the, the other two uh, threads are three-strand rope. Well, let me give two final points. One is that if scientists aren't going to advocate who, who should? Who's better suited for bias-controlled messaging to the public and policymakers? Well, I would say we don't want to cede this privilege to the courts, to the, to, to the uh, special interests, to the NGOs. I think that we have an obligation to be the mediators and the information brokers in some degree. Staying out of the fray in this case isn't really taking the moral high ground to avoid advocacy. It's really just passing the buck, and it isn't a form of sticking our head in the sand. It takes a certain bravery to go out 
and say what you think your best information is, why you think it, what your opponents say, and how you put, what other groups you brought in to help work on this wicked problem to pull the same direction. So I'd like to end with this one thought and question format before I hand the floor over. Shall we face wicked problems? When we face wicked problems, will our careers be better spent safe, wise, and coddling the truth in the security of science's ivory towers? Or will our, our thoughts have more meaning if we sally forth from the tower armed with the best existent information to work in the trenches occasionally. It really is a personal choice, but I encourage you to think carefully about advocacy of your science and how you might affect the world with careful outreach. So, be brave. Thank you very much.